credit for coming to this presentation. I'm Mauricio Vasquez. I work as a software engineer for Microsoft. I'm part of the King for Team there, so we did about Inspector Gadget and other projects using MPPF. Today's presentation is about how to use MPPF to generate some, net, some security policies for our cluster. So yeah, in today's presentation, I will show you a quick introduction of different security policies. Probably this is something you already know very good, but just in case we show you are on this page, we are going to show how can we generate those policies by using some different tools. Then we'll show you how can audit those policies when those are running on the cluster, and then I will present the different implications of this approach. Yeah, I should have forgot to mention something. This talk is to be together with Alban, but Alban is not here, so Alban will be helping out with some of the demonstration of this presentation. Okay, so let's get started with the Kubernetes security policies concept. We all know that Kubernetes offers different kinds of security, the, of security policies that we can use to make our cluster more secure. There are so many of them, but in this case, we will be concentrating on Zcom. Uh, both capabilities and network policies. There are things like open policy and other security related things in Kubernetes that we're going to cover on this presentation today. Well, the, the problem that we have with the security policies in Kubernetes is that they are difficult to configure. So, in order to configure those security policies, we have to understand what our application is doing. And this is something that we don't understand all the time. For instance, if we want to configure a second profile, we have, we have to know what are the system calls that are executed by our application. The same applies for Linux capabilities, and in the case of network policies, we have to understand how the different microservices that we are running there communicate to each other. Also, yeah, this is something that unfortunately is true. Many of the times, the person that is defining those policies is not the person that is developing the application. So maybe there is one person that develops the application, and then there is another person on the team, or maybe a different company also that has to configure the security policies for a different application. So this is for this person, this is very difficult to understand what are the security policies that has to configure, or better, how to configure those security policies, because many times that person doesn't have a lot of knowledge about the application there. So, yeah, in today's presentation, I want to present you an, a different way to generate those, or a different way to define those policies. So, what about if we observe the application, if we use some tools to observe the application and based on the behavior, based on the activity that the application is doing, we can define the security policies that we want to use for our application. So the idea is actually very simple. There are two steps. The first one is we have to observe the application. We have to understand what the application is doing. There are different technologies for that. In this case, for sure, we are going to use eBPF because it has a very low overhead. So when we are observing the application, we are not affecting too much the performance of that. And also, VPF is very, very flexible, so we are able to do a lot of things that we need to do there. So, yeah, that's the first step. We observe the application. We capture all the activity of, of the application. We know that what the application is doing. And then, by using that data, we generate a policy. This is something that, yeah, sometimes is really easy to do. For instance, for a second profile, this is just to capture the system calls and to put a list of system calls. For pod capabilities, it's the same, but in other cases, like network policies, this is really difficult because we have to generate the network policies in a way that are easier to understand for the developer of the operator of, of the platform. So, yeah, depending on the kind of network of policies that we are generating, it could be very easy or it could be really, really difficult. So, yeah, let's go ahead and start with the first kind of uh, security policies that I want to cover today. This is SecCom, so this is a mechanism on the kernel to limit the system calls that a given process can make. And yeah, we, how it works is that we define a SecCom profile, we put a list of system calls there, and we can tell the kernel, okay, if a given 
in a behaving process, execute this call, perform this action, and the action that we have are, for instance, just kill the process, we can send a signal to, to the calling process, we can deny the execution of the system call and return a re an error, or we can also execute the system call and log to, to the system. Actually, yeah, there are other actions that are support, but my intention here is not go to no to go into the detail of those ones. This is what a second profile looks like. So we have a default action. This is what happened by default when our when a given system call is not executed, or better, when a given system call is executed and it is not on the list that I have defined, then I can define different lists of system calls and put an action for that. So in this case. And allowing the few tests on the red front system call. And yeah, actually, in second profile, I can even define different lists of system calls with different uh, actions. So I can have a sort of mix, allow, and deny list together. In Kubernetes, we can define those profiles in the pod security context. This is from Kubernetes 1.19. Actually, before it was also possible to do, but it was defined by using an annotation in the container pod, but now this is deprecated, so I'm not going to talk about that today. Uh, we can configure the setcom profile at the pod or at the container level, so it means we can have the same setcom profile for all the containers on the pod, or we can even have different setcom profiles for each container in the pod. So this is what it looks like. We have the security context, we have the name of our security profile, and that by default is looking in this bar leaf cubelet uh, path. So yeah, actually handling uh, security setcom profiles in Kubernetes by hand is a little bit difficult because you have to be sure that the second profile that you have is installing all the different nodes, so you have to keep that aligned on the different nodes. So this is sometimes difficult to do, so for this reason there is the security profiles operator, so in this case you can define the setcom profile as a custom resource, and this project, this operator will take care of synchronizing the setcom profile on all the nodes in your cluster. This is just to show you an example of how we define a second profile, so here we have defined the second profile, and yeah, in this case this is a very simple one, we are only going to log all the system calls that are uh, secured. And this is how we associate a pod to that second profile. Actually, the SPO project has different ways to do that, but this is not so relevant for this presentation today. So yeah, let's get into the interesting part of this talk. So how do we define a second profile for our application? Of course, an allow list is the preferred approach. We only want to allow the system calls that we know that are safe. There are times that new system calls are added to the kernel, so if we are using a block list, maybe one of those dangerous system calls is implemented, we are not going to block that. So, yeah, in this case, this is better to have an allow list to be in the more secure side. But the problem with this approach is that we have to be sure that we include all the system calls that our application needs on the profile that we are defining. And then the question is, okay, so what are the system calls that my application needs? Well, how can we know that? The, the first option is, yeah, if we are developing an open source application, if we, if we have access to the code of the application, we can check and we can try to read the code to understand what are the system calls that the application is using, but actually this is really difficult. If you are using any standard library, maybe from Go, Lan, C, anything, you are doing a call to the standard library, but you don't know what is the system call that that standard, standard library is doing to the kernel. For instance, in, in some cases you can just call open, but the standard library implements that, like an open app call to the kernel, so there is no like a one-to-one -one mapping there. So yeah, this is a difficult approach. Another idea is to use Strace. We could run an application with Strace. Strace is a tool that prints all the system calls that are executed by a given application, but this is like a more invasive approach because we have to, we need Strace to be available in our container. So if you are running a digital image, you are not going to have Strace there. So yeah, it will need some more work to make that useful. 
Mm, another option is, yeah, we can define a simple set com profile by using the login action, and then we can check the audit log of the kernel. But actually, understanding what is on that audit log is not so simple because, for instance, there we don't even have the name of the system calls that are executed. We only have the, the number of the system call. That number depends on the architecture. So I will have to map those numbers to the name of the system call. So again, even if that's possible, that's not so easy to do. So the thing that I want to propose here, that we want to propose here is we can use a tool that records all the system calls that are executed by my application, and based on that, we can generate the second profile. Uh, as far as we understand, there are two different projects that allow you to do that. The first one is the security profiles operator that has an eBPF recorder, and the second one is the second advisor from Inspector Gadget. So let's look at a demonstration of the first uh, approach by using the security profiles operator. Hello, I will show you the security profile operator on how its eBPF encoder can monitor system calls and generate a second profile. So first I need to enable this feature. So I'm checking the enable BPF recorder feature is set to true. That's good. Then I need to enable in a on the feature in the namespace uh, I will do my testing. It has this label set to true, and that's good too. Then I need to uh, create a profile recording resource. Here I have a profile recording resource in the namespace of Intel, and it has a pod selector with a uh, selected label I want to test. Okay, so I apply this profile recording. Now it should be installed on my cluster. And now I deploy my pod. And this pod will have a label uh, that match the label selector of the profile recording. Okay. So now let's um, see my pod. It is deployed. I will generate some uh, network activity on it. For this, I use port forward to enable a tunnel to my app and I use some calls command to connect to my app. So this is working fine. Now I can stop the port forward and let's delete the pod. Okay, so let's see if my uh, second profile was generated. Yes, it is installed. Let's see what is inside. And here, I see generated a second profile with a default action of returning an error, except for the system calls, which are allowed. Thank you. Okay. okay, so that's the first way to generate those security second uh, profiles. And the other one is by using this Inspector Gadget Second Advisor. And yeah, actually, the, the mechanism that this is used is, is very similar. This is something that we implemented almost in parallel. The, the, two different, two very similar features implemented by two different teams of parallel. So, yeah, just yes, let me show you the second one. Hello. In this demo, I will use the Second Advisor to monitor my workload to see which system calls it is using. So let's start the gadget with uh, advice second profile as ask it to monitor the second demo namespace on the hello Python pod. I get a trace ID that I can use later to stop it. And now I can deploy my pod. This pod is unconfined, so it doesn't have any uh, second profile. I see it is running already. And I will uh, now generate some network traffic to it uh, to exercise different code paths. I use port forward, so I can use curl directly to it a bit later. So now I run a couple of curls command. I can see the result with the web page. And now uh, I can stop that. I will uh, stop the port forward and then uh, get the result from this gadget. So I reference the trace ID and I ask it to return um, the system calls in this file. Uh, so, 
If I look at this file, it will simply be uh, the list of system calls in a JSON format. So you see there are different system calls uh, for socket, TCP connections, and so on. I love this. I have this uh, file in a YAML format as well. This is a second profile from the security profile uh, operator. And here, uh, by default, it um, return an error for any unknown system call or it uh, allow the list of system call it has detected before. So I can uh, deploy this second profile that I generated. Now it should be installed on my cluster. And I will uh, deploy a pod that reference this second profile. So now it's no longer unconfined, it just reference the second profile um, I generated before. So let's deploy it, and that's it. Okay, so now we understood how to generate this second profile. But yeah, once we have those second profiles in place, we have running our applications with those uh, security profiles. How can we know a, a given second profile is, is will break my application or better? How can I know if a uh, given second profile is blocking some system calls that my application is trying to execute? Again, one option is to use this option lock. Mm. Actually, in this case, it will not block the system call, but will give you some understanding that the system calls are being executed. Then we can check this is locked, but again, as before, this is difficult to understand. So an alternative that we have is to use this second audit gadget that provides you, that tells you when a uh, uh, given set of profile blocks a system call from a pod. So let's look at uh, another demo about Hello. It. This time I will show the second audit gadget. I will use a different version of my second profile. This second profile contains the same list as, uh, of system calls as before that are allowed, but the default action will no longer be to return an error, but to log them. So the audit log will be able to uh, display them. So let's deploy this second um, profile. Now it should be deployed on my cluster. Okay, um, before deploying my uh, workload, I will uh, start the inspector gadget uh, gadget. So you can see the stream of uh, system calls being executed. So let's start this command uh, inspector gadget. Uh, I will monitor the second demo namespace and display the system calls on the return code and so on. Okay, so far there is nothing because I don't have even a workload. So let's see the workload. The workload reference my second profile uh, as I showed before. And let's deploy this. And let's see if it is running correctly. It is already running, but so far the only system calls that are executed are the one allowed, so there is still nothing to display here. I will try to generate a different uh, uh, network activity to see if uh, something happened. So like before, I will use power forward on some curl command. So power forward is running, so I can uh, run curl and see if anything happened. I get the result, I see the web page, but still nothing here because uh, as before, the only system call executed are the one that were uh, in my uh, allow list. Okay, so now I can stop uh, the network activity and uh, I will try something uh, different. I will exec into the pod and see uh, if uh, something different happened. I will execute bash, and bash should execute different kind of system call that were not uh, done before, so now the audit can notice them. And if I use this command, mkanode, that should allow uh, run this mkanode system call that is uh, that were not in the allow list. So I see it in the audit log. Thank you. Okay, so that's it about 
setcom. So let's move to another kind of uh, security profiles. Those are Linux capabilities. And yeah, since Linux 2.2, to a to, uh, uh, privileged process doesn't have all the capabilities of the system. So those privileged operations were divided into different blocks, if I can say that way. So the idea there is if there is a, if our process gets compromised, if a privileged process is compromised, it is only able to do some things on the system. So yeah, for instance, if we want to change, if a process needs to change the owner of a file, it has to be running under this caption capability. If it has to be buying at for less than 2024, it has to have this net buying service capability and so on. So the idea there is to have to limit the capabilities that a root process have. Of course, the list of capabilities in Linux is very long and actually some new are at, uh, in the different uh, releases of the kernel. Uh, in Kubernetes, I, the uh, container runtime gives us some capabilities by default and we can add or we can drop the, the capabilities that we want to give to our container by using this security contest. So this is an example. In this case, we are dropping all the capabilities, but we are only adding the capabilities that we need for our container. So yeah, the, the problem here is very similar to the previous one. How do we know the different capabilities that a given pod needs to run? And actually, in this case, it's actually more complicated because this is not only about system call, but the capabilities are like an internal comes it on the kernel. So sometimes those are used, sometimes those are no use, depending on the uh, kernel version that you are running on different configuration parameters of the kernel. So let me show you how you can generate, how you can understand the capabilities that a given application is using on a Kubernetes cluster. Hello, today I will deploy it with and see what kind of capability it uses. So uh, first look at the original version of Tracy. In the specification, you see it uses all the privileges. And uh, so far, I have not installed it. Uh, so let me install it first. I will uh, deploy the inspector gadget uh, capability trace gadget. I uh, deploy it on the Tracy system namespace, uh, looking at the specific port for Tracy and looking at all those uh, columns. And I don't want any duplicate capabilities, uh, so I specify the unique flag. Okay, so now let's start Tracy. And it should start very soon. Okay, it's already started. And you can see um, at the bottom the capability it has exercised uh, set pickup, pitrace, and this admin, this resource. Okay, so now um, we can delete it. and make some space and now um, we'll have a, a prepare the new version of Tracy instead of using privilege equal to it used the following capabilities and you can see it should uh, work in the same way as before and so this uh, gadget allows me to find which kind of capabilities are, uh, I can add in my pod spec okay thank you Okay, so yeah, that's it about uh, Linux capabilities. And the last one that I want to cover today are network policies. So yeah, this is just a quick overview. I will go very fast on that. So network policies are a Kubernetes mechanism to limit how the pod can communicate with a network entity. Network entity is another pod, a Kubernetes service or an external endpoint. Mm, Kubernetes network policies operate above the IP and the port la level, that's layer three, layer four, and we can use that to restrict the ingress or the egress traffic from a pod. This is an example of what it looks like a, a network policy resource. So we have the pod selector, it means the pods that the policy should apply to. This is where we define the policy. So here we are saying, okay, our pods should be able to communicate to other pods, other namespaces, other pods and namespaces, or IP blocks if those are external endpoints. And in the port, we say the, we define the layer four, the, the, the layer four of our network policy, that's the protocol and, and the port. 
So yeah, it was just a quick reminder of network policies. So how do we define a coordinated network policies? Well, usually those should be created when we are designing our architecture. But yeah, as I was telling you at the beginning, this is not what happened many, in many cases. So in some cases, you have to define the network policies after your application is already running. And yeah, in those cases, using a policy advice or using a tool that suggests you some network policies to be applied can be an option. And yeah, let me show you very quickly how we can generate those by using the uh, network policy advisor from Inspector Gadget. Hello, I will demo the network policy advisor. So I will deploy a workload and observe the network traffic done by this workload and then generate uh, network policies uh, thanks to the network policy advisor from Inspector Gadget. So uh, first I create this uh, demo namespace and uh, so far there is nothing in it and I will deploy uh, this Kubernetes manifest.yml. Uh, before that, uh, let's start the network policy advisor. Uh, start it with this command. I use the kubectl gadget advice command to monitor the network activity in the demo namespace and redirect the log in this file. Okay, so far there is no recording because uh, there is no network traffic, uh, but once I deploy the manifest, uh, at some point it will uh, create some uh, network activities. It will take some time to uh, prepare uh, all the deployment to be ready, so uh, let's wait some minutes. After some minutes, my deployment is successfully deployed. So now I can stop this. And then um, let's ask Inspector Gadget to generate the network policies from this log. And the network policy will be saved into this file. Then we can have a look at this file. And we see the first network policy generated is for the ad service. We noticed you noticed some um, egress traffic to uh, DNS, so power 53. UDP to the kube system, kube DNS service, and some uh, ingress service from the front end to some TCP port. And uh, you can see other uh, network policies for other services as well. Okay, and finally, how we do audit the network policies? So how we can know if our network policies go up in the packets from our application. So yeah, depending on the CNI provider that you are using, maybe you have that support implemented there. If you are using Cilium, they have this audit mode true or this flat better. And when you enable that, the Cilium doesn't enforce the network policy, but it will tell you when it eventually drop the packet there. If you are not using Cilium, there are other tools that can do the same at the IP table level. But yeah, in this case, you have to find a way to correlate the IP, the IP table role with the network policy that is dropping the, the packet. So yeah, just to finish here, I want to discuss the limitation of this approach. So the, the, I will say the biggest limitation here is that our application has to generate all the events that it needs to work when we are monitoring that. So if there is for instance, a given system call that our application needs, but is no use why we record that to generate the second profile, the second profile is going to block the system call. So when the application is, will try to use that specific system call when running, for instance, a production environment, that system call will be denied and our application won't work. Mm. So how to, so how can we ensure that our application is generating all uh, events that it requires in the real scenario? Well, maybe one option is to deploy our application in a production environment, send real traffic to that and monitor that there. Of course, there is some risk in running an application in production without security policies. Another option is to uh, run some integration tests to try to go to the different parts of the code so those are one of the options that we have, but actually this is like the very 
the biggest limitation and it's difficult to do. So there is no like, this is the way to do that. There are so many different options. And the second limitation, this is, I would say, limitation warning is that we are, when we use this technique, we are assuming that our application is trust. So we are monitoring the application. If there is any uh, malicious activity going there, we are going to include that into our security profiles. So basically what it means is that we are going to allow the malicious activity in the security profiles that we are generating. So yeah, we, we have to be sure. I don't know how to do that, to be honest. I don't have an answer how to be sure that our application is trust, but we should be sure that this is why we use this approach. And yeah, just to finish, there was a, I would say, similar talk this Monday in the cloud eBPF negative day. That is also how to generate the security profile by using eBPF. But in this case, it was by the ISO Valentin. They were using Tetragon for that. So if you, if you are interested on that, maybe you can check the recording of that. It should be available on YouTube in some weeks. And yeah, that's it. So happy to take any questions that you can have. Thank you. Thanks for the great talk, and not just great, but comprehensive overview. Um, my question is, um, it's all the, in the limitation about, you know, during the recording phase, you can, you know, create policies only what you saw in the recording phase, right? So you, what you haven't seen, you cannot define. Have you been looked into or researched how could you decide when to stop recording? I mean, when to, or how to signal to end recording? And you say, I saw enough the, of the application activity that now I can turn this into a policy? Yeah, that's a very good question. We haven't done that. So, so far, when to start, when to stop recording is totally controlled by the user. So you as an operator, you say, okay, I want to deploy my application. I will start recording. Then you, I don't know, you wait for one hour, 24 hours, depending on an application, and you say, let's stop. But yeah, maybe that will be something interesting to, to explore how to start and stop recording in an automated, smart way. Thank you. Thank you. When, uh, if SETCOMP stops an application because it breaks a uh, security policy, what is the experience of either the app dev or the operations team? What do they see when that happens? Oh, sorry, I can't understand. Will you mind removing your mask for a bit, please? I can't uh, understand what you're sure. asking. Um, yeah, when SecComp uh, takes some action on an application that's running, it breaks a policy. Uh, what is the experience for the operations team or the application that created that? Is that just an error or what do they see to know that this app broke one of the policies? Yeah, so when the second profile is violated, depending on that, it could kill your application. So what you see is a, pro, a pod that is crashing off because the application is being killed there. Does it say, like, like pods crash sometimes frequently? So does it say a particular reason why the pod crashed? You will have to check the logs. Okay. from the application. I mean, if you are using the audit second that I was showing you before, that will tell you what is going on. Yeah. So that will tell you that a given second profile send a kill signal to a given process, and it will give you information about the container, the pod, and so on. If you are not using that, the only information that you have available is the log of the application. Uh -huh. So you will have something like the process was, was killed, and that's it. Probably there is also something in the audit log from the operating system about that. But in that case, you will have to correlate the PID with the pod. So right. in that case, if you are running a lot of pods in a node, this is not easy to understand what is the pod that was killed. Right, yeah, exactly. Okay, this is not great. Okay, cool. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for the talk, it was really helpful. Um, it looks like the tools that you showed are really helpful for developing the initial policies that you want to enforce. Uh, my question is, as applications change over time, they may have requirements for new Linux capabilities. Uh, they may need to make new system calls. Um, do you have any thoughts on how you can 
maintain these policies over time such that it's not blocking application developers from making progress? Yeah, I will say that this is a rather difficult question. So the idea that we have with these tools is, okay, you don't have any policies. We suggest you what could be an initial version of those policies. So the idea is not to use these tools automatically. So the idea is you, as a developer, you use the tools, and then you have to understand the output of those tools, and you have to be sure that the things that are in the security profile make sense. I'm not totally sure that it will make sense to update those profiles automatically when the application changes, because what about if there is a malicious activity there and you are updating those profiles automatically to allow the malicious activity that is going there? Or better, how can I understand, okay, yes, I, I updated the application, so I have to update the profile because my application is doing something similar. How can you be sure that that's the case and that this is not about that you are having some malicious activity there? So yeah, I mean, this is very complex to understand if you can update that automatically without human super supervision there. Hi. I was pretty interested in the network policy generation and I noticed the network policies that get generated there you know, using pod selectors with labels to clearly identify the pod that is involved in the network policy. How, how intelligent is that network policy generation? Is it trying to create like the simplest possible network policy or how does it decide what labels? Yeah, what you, goes you, into that? you have a point, very good question. Yeah, so the, the general logic that we have is that you cap, we capture the traffic. So the traffic that we capture has the, I mean, source destination IP addresses and we enrich that data with Kubernetes-related information. So we do a, a transformation like from IP to pod name, service, and so on. And at that point, we capture the labels of those uh, pods, uh, services, and so on. And then we try to consolidate that to generate the, the network policies. Actually, what we are doing right now is like try to be as granular as possible, so we are generating very small network policies. So actually, if you are running so many different services, you are going to have a very big generated network policy. And this is what I was talking at the beginning. I mean, we have a limitation there because how can we consolidate those network policies in less network policies with more labels? This is something that, that we don't know yet how to do, so probably more work has to be done there in order to provide network policies that are consolidated and that are easier to understand for the users. Actually, one very simple case is when there is a pod that is reaching an external uh, host, I mean by IP, so we only generate a slash 32 rule. But what about if actually the pod is trying to access a subnet? So how can we consolidate those into a subnet? This is something that, that we don't know how to do that, and this is something that we require more research on that. Thank you. Thank you. Last one. The uh, output for the, that is used to create the network policy, that log file, is it human readable? Like, could it be used to audit the like, frequency of traffic and like create a profile so that if you're trying to create a secure network policy based off of that output, you have information to use. Like obviously as a sysadmin or security sysadmin, you have more information about the expected traffic between services. So if you can use that, not actually the generated policy, but the log file to inform the network policy that you're creating, like is that is that possible? Is that a use case that's been considered? So do you mean only to capture the data about the the network packets and then use that for? Yeah, like you've got that log file that is being used to create the network policy. Rather than just creating the network policy, use that log file to create a traffic profile that you can then use to inform the network policy. Yeah, actually, those are two tasks. I mean, capturing the traffic and re enriching the traffic with Kubernetes information is like the easy task. The difficult task is, okay, how do we convert that network traffic that we have captured into a network policy. Currently, we have a very simple algorithm there that just tries to consolidate that, but 
Yeah. There, there are many options that we haven't explored yet. Yeah, I mean, it just seems like it'd be very interesting to output a profile rather than a policy. So something, you could run that, that advisor several times and compare the traffic over a period of time to see like, oh, we're getting hit by this request at this frequency, which is not something we expect and maybe is a malicious actor that we should look into. Yeah, that, that could be also an option. Also, thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you.